of uh, VR and AR and mixed realities experts that are going to be talking to us about a lot of that tactical detail stuff. So you guys have all had a chance to engage over the last two days with um, some of the new technologies with VR to see some of the fantastic stuff um, that is available to hear Malia talk about the possibilities of VR and everything that's happening right now. And I'm hoping that you're seeing all of the, the fantastic realities of virtual reality and what can be done. And um, maybe you're in a situation where you're thinking, ah, this isn't really my, my industry. It's not actually going to you know, be impacted by it right away. Maybe it's a few years down the road. But um, I hope talking a little bit more detail about what's happening will help us kind of open our minds up a little bit more and then see that maybe pieces of this technology will fit into what you're doing. Maybe not in exactly the same way that the military is using it or exactly the same way that other industries are using it, but in, uh, in, a, ta in a tactical way, some piece of this technology is going to impact everybody uh, sooner rather than later. Mm -hmm. So um, so let me just start off with, uh, to the right of the table, but to my immediate left, Peter, why don't you introduce yourself? And you guys can just share the microphones there. Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. Peter Campbell, and I'm the Director of Strategy for Immersive Learning Solutions at Pearson. Pearson is the world's largest educational content producer. I see a lot of shaking heads, so people who have attended. Every, anybody not know who Pearson is? <laughs> if, okay. if you've been through K-12, which I suspect most of you have, or if you've graduated from a college or university, you've probably used a Pearson product um, in your lifetime. So um, uh, we're, we're focused right now on a, a number of initiatives in immersive learning. Uh, we're, we're doing a lot of really interesting work with HoloLens, currently in partnership with Microsoft. We're doing uh, quite a lot of work in 360, immersive 360, interactive 360. And uh, we're scratching the surface on VR right now. We've got some early stage projects that we're working on that we're very excited about. But um, we're, uh, we're, we're heads down really looking at all these opportunities. So for this audience, you know, we, Pearson is not well known for what we do in the, in the corporate space and, and the professional learning space. We, we aspire to get into that space eventually more. We've got some limited presence there now. But basically at the end of the day, as you guys know all too well, Good instructional design is good instructional design, right? So what we, what we do at Pearson in terms of that instructional design, in terms of problems to be solved and how this technology can be used to address those problems is universal across vertical, across industry. So uh, happy to be here. Awesome, thanks. Hi guys, my name is Victor Vanson. Um, I run a company called Future Sculpt. Um, we focus mainly on immersive technologies and in the three particular areas. So the future of work, education, and health. Um, before, you know, some of the work we do is, is we've done work with um, MIT, NASA, JPL, um, IndyCar, and so forth and so forth. Um, my previous company was focusing on uh, education mainly and how to bring creativity back in education in nine through 12. And uh, we created experiences, architectural uh, technology experience um, across all kinds of content platforms, uh, mainly for uh, high school education. And um, first of all, thank you, Brent and, and Luis, for, for putting this on. I think um, this is a very relevant uh, topic for how these technologies can be used for um, things that makes, make us better, learn better, um, and so forth and so forth. So, um, you know, I think uh, it's an extremely relevant subject right now. Um, my name is Casey Sapp. I'm just curious, how many people have tried a headset on yet? Yay! How many people tried on a headset here? Yay! Yes. <laughs> Who's excited about the technology? Yay! Yes. Good. <laughs> I think you good. Are. good. Yes. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> So I'm, I'm not as big of a deal as these guys, but I, um, I started a company last summer that does high-end commercial productions for 360 video. And we saw that as the lowest barrier to entry for um, education, for the consumer, uh, for brands, and we've started to expand into HTC Vive development. So um, our clients are SeaWorld. We're helping build the theme park attraction for them. Uh, Google, we, we are releasing a number of Google Expeditions, which are these virtual reality tours for
for students. Um, Ford, we're building a commercial. Uh, and, and then there's a, a really exciting virtual reality series that's been in Wired and Fast Company this week uh, with the director of um, Born Identity. And uh, it's going to be called Invisible. And that's going to be coming out in about two or three weeks. So we kind of sit on the production and post-production side. And, and I'm what, what Peter is to kind of product visionary and, and creative, I, I end up being more of the kind of technical execution guy. And, and so the creatives come to us to figure out how to solve the problem. And so that's been really fun and uh, just keeps me in the space. And, and so before this, I was in education for 10 years. Uh, I helped start a company with Matt Patinsky, who started Blackboard, uh, named Parchment, and uh, helped do a, a military accelerator called Fidelis Education out of uh, San Francisco. I, and so I just, I love education, that's why I'm here. And I just stay in it uh, because of the passion, um, not because of the money <laughs> yet. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah, the money's not quite here in education yet in, uh, in what we do. So you know what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to do this a little bit differently. And let's just start with the audience first, because I don't think with our last panel I got to the audience fast enough. So uh, we've talked a lot about mixed realities and virtual reality. and. Uh, for those of you uh, lucky enough to hang out with us uh, in Victor's session yesterday, he was kind enough to bring his HoloLens and uh, was, uh, I'd never been in a HoloLens yet and so it was fun for me to, to experience that. I'd done the Vive, but um, it was, that was fantastic. Thank you, Victor, for doing that. Who, who else, is anybody here that was in it and got to try it out too? Yeah, great. What were your thoughts on the HoloLens? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Who and so who tried the HTC Vive that was in there? Who who wants to tell me a little bit about? It? All right, I'll go to both of you, but let's start with you. Uh, I was, um, that was like the I don't know fifteenth time I went through. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it was it was really fun, and I'm looking forward to trying it again. Yeah, awesome. What were your thoughts? Yeah, I don't, I, I, like I was saying in day one, I don't think you really realize how much reality really disappears when you get into one of these environments. Even as cartoony as some of them may look to you or as, as not real as they look, the immersive experience of separating yourself is, is, is fantastically real, and which was why I encouraged everybody to take a look. Is there anybody here who just is not, still has never had a VR experience? Oh, rats, okay. Now my new goal in life is to get you into a VR experience. Joe. Oh, yeah. Making a movie too. Yeah, Spielberg is making a movie. Yeah, yeah, next year. Yeah, definitely looking forward to that. So, so who's got a question uh, specifically about the virtual reality? Either your experience, your technology, maybe the environment that you currently work in. Maybe just a question. Maybe they've got a case study or two that they've done that's similar. Tricia.
That's a tough one. Who wants to take it? <laughs> so what kind of training do they do? Got it. <laughs> well, I think, <laughs> and it's a bank. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think. Look, look. I think virtual reality is important to e-learning because all the areas that it falls short, VR will help solve that in the next few years. Social interaction, physical activity, exercises. I mean, we're talking that the reason why people aren't in e-learning is because of VR in a lot of ways, and that's kind of crazy to think about. But um, you can't learn everything through a computer screen. And you have to be with people. And there will be a time where you can strap on a headset, put on some gloves, and, and learn in this risk-free environment. And you can practice it over and over and over again. So, so Just dialed her in. Yeah, so I, I, so I mean, especially hands-on activities. If you don't know how to cut a piece of wood, you could put on a headset, grab a saw, and learn how to cut a piece of wood, right? Well, and you practicing talking to a customer when you've got to tell them. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, public speaking. I mean, there's already apps out there that are CG, but I mean, hyper realism. Uh, there, there are some some projects getting developed where it's going to feel like I'm sitting right here, and I can practice public speaking as much as I want. Mm -hmm. You know, I yeah. think um, there's also. And I know this is like a pro VR thing uh, panel, but there's also I think it's important to put on devil's hat, ad, ad, sort of devil's advocate hat on sometimes because there's there's a lot of you know there's a lot of stuff. So, so the thing is, whenever a new medium comes about, the first thing we start doing is we start using it like the last medium. So it's inevitable that the stuff we're doing in first right now is okay with sort of how can education be better with VR? Oh, let's put somebody in the classroom in VR, sort of, but distance learning, but sort of, well, that doesn't, right, so why should we not do that in a two-dimensional two format or YouTube videos? So I think that's always the first question to ask when in sort of in, in that, those first kind of strategic moments, right? So really solve that question on why, why should something happen in three dimensions in, in, in an immersive space, and inherently, when you're dealing with you know with data and 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 banks and right screens that actually you work from a screen already, the question becomes where right, actually it becomes a more difficult situation because well, what is the point of a virtual space in that sense? And to your point, um, dealing with customers, all those things that are sort of more interpersonal that are not towards the screen, but what else is happening that is not on a screen um, that VR can help with is, is, a, is an interesting first uh, way to look at the question, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Peter, have you seen anything in the, along those lines? Yeah, I mean, I'll, um, coming from an instructional design perspective, I used to be an instructional designer, so you know, thinking about it from, from your perspective at, at your bank and serving your customers, thinking very specifically what is the problem to be solved here and then how do these technologies help you solve that particular problem and layering on top of what Casey and Victor were saying you know maybe in some instances that this technology is actually the wrong choice altogether like this is not this is not a good use of this technology but to the extent that you can simulate experience in the real world and leverage these technologies to then allow people to experience different outcomes in layering on what Casey was saying in a risk-free environment where failure is actually promoted, where, you, where you're allowed to do, to do things that you would not otherwise be able to do. That's a really encouraging use of the technology. Um, Alex Howland was supposed to be here on the panel today, and he's, he's got a really interesting company called Verbella. And Verbella is not um, a, a, a 3D immersive experience, it's actually done via 2D avatars, similar to what you might see on, in a Second Life. I don't know if any of you are familiar with Second Life, but right, I mean, it's, like a, it's, a, a, it's another world where it's, it's two-dimensional avatars. Uh, but his, his, uh, his company is actually doing some really interesting work around training and assessment using 2D avatars. So it, it doesn't need to be as you know, fully immersive to still achieve really good results. And then I'll say the last thing um, and, and brag a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing. 
Um, we, we, uh, we, we tried to look at the opportunities that 360 video in particular afforded, largely because it's relatively technologically uncomplicated and not as expensive as, as doing mixed reality or virtual reality development. And we wanted to, to think about how we could put learners into these realistic spaces and use performance-based assessment, actually have people behave in a particular manner um, that would only be possible in these environments. So I'll, I'll give you a specific example. We took uh, a five-day uh, on-site death by PowerPoint course. You've never ever seen those before, ever, I'm sure. <laughs> right. Um, five-day death by PowerPoint course where these poor souls were, were PowerPointed to death and we completely transformed that. This was for a customer in, in the UK, the industry of safety and health, an association there. And they were, they were turning out safety and health inspectors. And so they were doing this by PowerPointing them to death. So we, we radically transformed the approach. We, we took that same course and we front loaded all of the content, or most of the content, made it asynchronous online. So they did most of their training online. But then they came to the site for one day and the experience culminated with a performance-based assessment where they put on a Samsung Gear VR and they were then magically transported into an unsafe work environment. So they looked up, they saw the ceiling, they looked down, they saw the floor, they looked off to the left and they saw this guy with a chainsaw <laughs> cutting ice and the, the sound is blaring in your ears and you look off to your right and you see another guy cutting ice with a chisel and you notice that there are mats piled up all over the floor and there's wires hanging down from the ceiling, there's ice all over everywhere. It's, it's a disaster, right? But now the student who's ostensibly been trained in how to identify risk and safety violations is suddenly put in that room and can spot all the violations. And by virtue of that performance, they can demonstrate that they've learned something, right? So it's good for the student because the student says, hey, I actually know a thing or two. This has been a useful experience for me. I can show that I know this. It's great for the instructor because the instructor actually has performance-based evidence that the student can apply these skills and demonstrate these competencies. But more importantly, the employer that receives these students at the end of the day has greater confidence that these students can do something day one that they would not otherwise be able to prove. So I encourage all of you to just think through that lens um, and then call Casey because uh, Casey's a good guy, and Casey can help you design a 360 training environment that would meet those needs. Yeah, it's interesting that uh, the, the point Victor made about we always use the old, old versions of, we apply new technologies to what we've done in the past. I think Mark Ehlert and, uh, can relate to this, uh, the whole Second Life experience of first time doing education in Second Life. What do you do? What did somebody build? They built a classroom with a whole bunch of chairs lined up like this. And there was somebody standing up in front and there was a PowerPoint pro slide projector inside of it. And we're all like, wait, what? We're in a 3D space and we're in a classroom. Wait, they, there's gotta be better than this. <laughs> Go ahead, yeah, Brandon. <laughs> but I was, we do a lot of compliance training around safety. And I was observing a person doing training on forklifts, uh, how to operate forklifts. And he was doing an assessment of e-learning on a computer, nowhere near a forklift. Because he obviously can't operate the forklift until the forklift's out. <laughs> but he was having a hard time answering one of the assessment questions, which was asking him to identify uh, something about a forklift. <laughs> I don't know what to do. And what a struggle it takes us about three months to create a course that we can distribute to these folks. And we have tons of different types of forklifts. So where I see something like this really being impactful is letting them operate the forklift before they sit on the forklift. Because you literally can hurt yourself or other people by doing this. We have this inauthentic example in e-learning that it's too difficult for us to make authentic because it takes us too long. We don't know what forklift we're going to have at that store. On and on and on and on, right? So we want the authentic experience in a safe, and like the Microsoft Flight Simulator thing, right? Yeah. In a safe environment. But it's something that has to be modifiable, right? Because we, we have different equipment and folks really attach to the what is in my work. Yeah. 
exactly. Yeah, go ahead, Peter. Yeah, I've yeah. got just a story to add to that. So we, we, we had a similar experience. One of our, our strategic customers over in the UK, our Pearson's headquartered in London, right? So we have a lot of customers in the UK. One of our big strategic customers is the Royal School of Military Engineering, part of the UK Ministry of Defense. And they had a very sort of seemingly banal problem, not, not unlike what your situation is. And so they, they had to train these military engineers the basic cockpit controls of a backhoe, right? So what do they do? Well, they, there's 15 students in a class. They line up, say, all right, come on up. So the first one comes up there. They, this is the start, this is the this, this is the that, all right? You got it? Yeah. Next, right? But while all the other ones are sitting in line, they're just doing this, you know, twiddling their thumbs, et cetera. So we looked at that and said, well, what if they could all just do that at the same time using 360 video in a, in a, gear, in a, in a gear VR headset? So that's what we've done. It's, so now all of them are receiving that same kind of instruction virtually, getting a tour of the cockpit, which is what they were doing, right, in real time, face to face. But we're doing it at the same time. What's the instructor doing? The instructor's floating around amongst the students. And if there's a particular question that comes up, the instructor can answer that to that with that student on a just-in-time, need-to-know basis. But all the others are getting the same exact training in that exact cockpit that they're training on. And then they then they jump into the real one, right? So they've got a, they've got that much more sort of preparation uh, to actually perform the task. That's three to five years out, unfortunately. Um, there, yeah, there is some yeah. low, so HTC Vive now has released their sensors and open source them so that you can actually develop um, low level motion capture and associate real objects in that experience that, you know, within the sensors to pick up and, and then they actually move um, in the virtual environment. So what uh, I, think, I think what I see happening in that yeah. space is where um, HoloLens is going to come in and start playing a, a much a stronger role because instead of having to try to fake um, the sensations in the, those grips, what you might have is that with the HoloLens, since you can see through it, right, we can see a table and whatnot, and you may look through and you may uh, look and there may actually be maybe a fake chainsaw, but it's got the weight and the feel of it. But through the HoloLens, the, the, the digital side can crank up a blade on it. When, right. there's, when there's no blade, the thing you're grabbing has no blade, it's not turned on, but it's a tactile thing. So now you pick it up, but while you're looking at it, it looks like a real chainsaw, but it may just be a, 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 a block of wood weighted the exact same and, way, you know? And so you can start to see the future of being able to fake some of that with these augmented realities and the way it's all going to blend together. I think, I don't know. No, I mean, it's available off. in the vibe today. I mean, you could, you could, for the right amount of money, you could do that. Um, you know, for probably ten to $30,000, you could make that 360 video. Um, and then you could build an experience where it looks like you're in the cockpit and you're pulling levers and, you know, with your hands. So it's, it's all about how much money you got, but it's all there. Yeah. Right. <laughs> So How can we that? stop doing that. Yeah. I think it's also <laughs> these, uh, these are these are the three guys you want to talk to. I think it's also you know the, the part of the part that's very important that we kind of rarely talk about is is um, the full experience, right? The design of the experience. So right now when we say VR, AR, this and that, um, we really talk about what's happening in the headset. But I think it's very important to to design the experience for what's happening before and after. Right, how, you know, what are the entry points, uh, all the touch points that you need to hit on, because it is truly full experience, right? And, and people don't, you know, we wouldn't notice it, but when you actually think about it, how somebody gets introduced to it, what happens afterwards. So I don't think there will, within the next 30 years, be fully seamless tactile solution for how a chainsaw will feel like in, in VR. But there can be surrogates almost, right? So you can, 
the experience needs to be redesigned because you're dealing with a completely different medium. So what happens before that needs to be redesigned, what happens afterward needs to be redesigned. And that's when you really yeah. think about the, the, the flow, the cost, you know, benefits and so forth and so forth and kind of recalculate those models. And, and if you do enough, I mean, the solutions will bring those costs down. It's just where in the experience does it happen? Yeah, let's, right. get a, let's get another one of the questions in, yeah. Pokemon. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's certainly a, um, a, a consideration. I think there's, there's tremendous potential for good and tremendous potential for evil <laughs> with, with this technology. So I'll give you one case in point. Um, a gentleman named Jeremy Balenson, who's uh, one of the key thought leaders in, in virtual reality, has been doing this for a very, very long time, about as long as anybody. He's at Stanford, and um, the work that he's been doing has, has certainly influenced a lot of my thinking. So one of the experiments that he did was he created a VR experience whereby students uh, put on a, a VR headset, they get down on all fours, and they assume first-person perspective of being a cow. And they then get to experience what it's like to go to slaughter. So I've not experienced it myself, but I mean, you can imagine the powerful impact of you know, releasing that experience onto the world and what that would do to meat consumption globally, potentially, right? So, I don't know if there's a lot of vegetarians or vegans in the room, but you know, you can imagine, maybe that's not a bad thing, right? Um, but you can also imagine something in your sort of dystopian frame, a la Clockwork Orange, where you know, you know the scene where Alex is being uh, tortured, uh, basically, uh, to make him a better person. So you can certainly imagine, um, you know, certain dystopian implementations where someone could be, uh, could be exposed to some pretty horrific things. So l like most of these, these technologies, we just have to be very mindful of, of, of those, uh, those potentials and those pitfalls. Anybody else have a comment on that? You go. Um, I mean, it's, it's a bit of a hard one, right? I think there, there's, there's something that sort of are inevitables, right? There's, for example, I think 20 years ago, we had, a, we had a notion that something like Facebook and Twitter would exist. We just didn't know that they were gonna be called Facebook and Twitter. So th we know that there are certain things that will happen. It's just inevitable, I think. The question is what those, those companies are gonna be called. Is it gonna be Facebook or Google or you know, H HTC? But, um, I think, the, and it's a much, much deeper conversation of what those inevitables will look like and the longer one, but I do think uh, long conversation short is, and that's part of sort of uh, my goal with the new company really is, you know, there's a lot of investment going into gaming, porn, and so forth and so forth, entertainment, and, and that's all, you know, that's always gonna be needed. Um, People love that, and that's fine. And uh, there's short-term gains to be made from that. But uh, you know, like 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 Peter said, is is we sort of discovered fire again here, right? So it can destroy, and it can uh, make, it can build. And I, I truly believe that. So I think it's in our best interest to to start setting the standards really early. And and you know, kind of keep thinking about when the internet was invented, right? Did we think of these questions, we didn't quite think of those questions, right? So what if there was sort of a ethical standard that would be set for the internet 20, 30 years ago of, hey, this is what could be good, this is what could be good, bad, so how do we you know, benchmark that stuff? And I think it's even more important with, uh, with, with, these, with these new technologies. So the question is, you know, what does it look like? Who's gonna who's gonna be doing it, and 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 how does that be? How how is that be being put in motion? And I think that's why these conversations with you guys are uh, very important. Well, yeah, you can feel free. Um, yeah, 
It's funny. I was that's how I was going to respond. Was uh, the you know the good side I think is accelerated learning. I mean, you can at a low cost create you know these million dollar flight simulators. You can do this for free now, and anyone can do it. That's that's a big deal. Um, the the downside is accelerated learning, <laughs> and I mean that's a loss of innocence in in some ways. And the brain I, the brain studies that I've seen show that the younger you get, the more they can't decipher reality and virtual reality, and they actually store we we all store these experiences in a different part of the brain than a normal video. So so think about that. You know you I've had dreams after having watched these things for for an hour or two that night like I was actually in there. So you can even kind of rewrite the, the past in some ways of, of what actually happened. And that's from personal, you know, just hands-on experience. So, um, so yeah, I think ultimately it's a, uh, I think technology and the reason why I'm in it is morally neutral and it's just how we use it and it always has been. And there are the ones like us who are gonna use it for in this room, you know, for really positive purposes, and there are people who are just going to push the limit and just mess everyone up. So. Yeah, another question. Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, so it's the camera. It's pre-production and deciding what's gonna be good in 360, because not everything's great in 360. Uh, there is the camera that you decide. That can go anywhere from a GoPro to something off the shelf, which I, I'm not really a fan of, to Ozo, Jaunt, Reds. You know, these are $5,000 cameras a day to rent, but they give you the actual best experience that you can possibly get. Um, and then there is rendering, and that takes Nuke that takes After Effects, uh, and depending on editing and and you know how how clean you want to make that shot, um, th there's mono versus stereo. That's a consideration. 2D versus 3D. A lot of people can do mono. A lot of people cannot do stereo. Um, and then that budget just goes from you know a thousand dollars to half a million overnight. So um, I think what's really important with the studio that you want to work with whoever you work with, is that um, it, you can save a lot of money in pre-production just through some really simple best practices. Uh, if you don't go on alone, you can, you can make the decisions of where someone's gonna be, how you place the camera, and save all that headache in, in post. So it really depends on how realistic you wanna make it, how fast you wanna turn it around, you know, how good you want the picture quality to be. Um, but, but ultimately, if you just want to do a 360 video as a former you know, video professional, you can go by color, auto panel giga. It's about $500. Go get a 360 rig off of the, the internet, $500. Put some cameras in it, shoot it, plug it in there, and you get something that's pretty decent. So anyone can start somewhere. It just depends on how much do you want people to feel like they're actually there. Yeah. I would yeah. also say, oh, okay. um, one of one of the things, one of one of the good things is that that everyone can go and do this stuff. That's also one of the bad things, because <laughs> uh, you know the the thing is, and, and even looking at this room, there's and, and really still there's a a lot of people that haven't seen any of it, right? So a lot of people will be introduced to crappy VR experiences, and it's not like a crappy iPad app, right? You can actually get sick mm -hmm. and want to throw up. So point is if you can whenever you can just you know work with really good people that know what they're doing um, trust me it's gonna save you a lot of headache and a lot of money at the end uh, we are having these conversations with tons of people that say it's like oh well we have like this guy right and it's uh, no no you, <laughs> you don't want to go there uh, because it's also very strategically it's important. If you can show a really good uh, VR experience to someone, that's can, they can change their life, really, if, if you show a bad one. It, you got another question in the back there. Yeah. Yeah.
Yeah, it's usually, it's, it's sort of a good three rule thing uh, that we sometimes use is sort of, okay, what does it make sense to do it? Is it too expensive to do it in real life? Uh, or, you know, uh, to simulate it to be really close? Is it too dangerous? Um, is it simply, you know, you, you can't do it in real life, right? That's, and, and, and that's when you start, should start thinking about simulating VR experiences, I think. Good. Uh, I saw some other hands earlier, and I just wasn't able to get to you. Any other questions? I wanted to ask, um, got about some time. So what I wanted to ask was, I'll just toss this question in here while everybody's still thinking about it. Um, what, like what have you guys seen? You guys are connected to it. You see it every day. Uh, you know, what have you seen that's really impressed you and made you really get excited about it again? Because I'm certain that it has to happen, right? You're excited about it, you're into it, you know it, but every now and then you must see something or see a need or something that really reaffirms the idea that virtual reality uh, in whatever form you want to you wanna mention um, is is a good thing for education and for learning, and, and, it, and it can be used, even if it's really ad hoc. Uh, it doesn't have to be uh, deep, but you know, a lot of people, I think, see 360 video as, oh, kind of fake virtual reality. But I just see it along that spectrum that, that Victor was talking about in his session yesterday. It's a, it's, a, it's a step up from regular video, and it has some affordances to it that a regular video isn't going to give you, so there's value in that. Even a, even a 180 degree still image is better than a regular still image. It has some added value to it and you can use that in a certain way. Have you guys seen anything in learning that uh, either low budget super impactful or high budget super impactful that really kind of impressed you as a solution? Well, um, I, I think, um, you know, I'm, um, I'm kind of a big proponent for the um, stuff that the HoloLens does, which is, um, if you guys haven't tried it, it's basically, it's, it's sort of like Star Trek. It's really at 10 years ahead of its time in many ways. We shouldn't have had this yet. Um, but it brings a lot of implications in terms of just lower production costs and stuff, which is, which is another conversation. But um, I think, again, to me, what becomes more interesting is is not as much as what happens on the screen, but how people start interacting in real life using this technology. So with devices like you put on your head, either you see stuff on the other side. So I see with the HoloLens, I see the furniture, but I see imposed objects and pretty much um, stuff, right? Or it's VR, but I don't see anything. I think it's you know the the most exciting piece to me is is pretty much I think what NASA is doing. We have, we have some uh, friends over at NASA, JPL, and what they're exploring is uh, new ways to take scientists to Mars, and pretty much have uh, them put on the Hololens and it's called on site, and the floor turns into a replica of the Mars surface where the rover Curiosity rover actually went through and took pictures. So the rover takes pictures sends it back to uh, JPL, their uh, team with photogrammetry uh, team stitches it together into pretty much a real replica of the terrain on Mars, which is baffling, right? So then you have, you can have a scientist in Singapore, a scientist in New York, and a scientist at JPL put on a whole lens and pretty much converge and see this see that exact point and see it in one-to-one -one scale and see the rover in one-to-one -one scale. And uh, that to me is really uh, breaking new ground, right? So now you have this extreme collaboration that the, these devices enable. And it goes beyond entertainment, it goes beyond sort of gaming, right? But it's really how do we as uh, human species start to work more efficiently solving really interesting problems, like, you know, how to go to Mars. That's interesting. Anyone else, Peter? 
I don't know where to start. I've, <laughs> I, was just, I was thinking about that one. Too that broad one, of a one. question. I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, there's, I and mean, that's why I'm in this space because it's just, it's, it's, it's breathtaking, right? I'm um, just to, I mean, the the immersive aspect itself, and for those of you who've tried it on recently, or you know, just that sense of really being somewhere that you're not is just extraordinary. I mean, my first, my first VR experience, I was hanging from a helicopter dangling over uh, the island of Manhattan, and I was really dangling from a helicopter. I really, truly believe it. It was, it was incredibly compelling. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think uh, for, for, for your purposes, thinking about how you guys are thinking about this, um, you know, again, it's that, I think it's simple things where, where you know, what I've seen being in a, in a, and again, this, this 2D avatar experience that I talked about before, there are other types of, uh, there are other companies that are doing similar things. There's a company called Mersion, um, based out of the, the Bay Area, and it's that same concept. It's 2D avatars, and that you are, you are asked to be a certain person in a certain role, so it's everything that we all know, right, as good instructional designers, how, how important role play is, but in this context, I'll give you a specific example. Um, I was I was a fifth grade teacher in this in this user this use case. Okay, so I looked out in front of me, and there were five fifth grade students in front of me, right? And they were avatars. And if, if, if my first thought was, you know, this is kind of BS. This they're clearly CG. They're not real students. But then the task was, okay, Peter, um, teach a, a, a concept that's relevant to this grade. Um, do an intro on photosynthesis. So that's that's easy. I'm a, I have a background in classroom education, I'm a pretty good teacher, I can do this simple. So as I began to teach this concept, um, there was a student in the back falling asleep, there was another student who constantly interrupted me asking questions, and then I realized, oh wait a minute, I'm being set up here, because now I'm, it's not so much my instruction that's being assessed, it's my classroom management skills that are being assessed. And, and so I need to impress the people that are watching me that I know what I'm doing here. Uh, so it was it was fantastic use of the technology, right? Because I got to step back and then debrief a little bit and said, good strategy here, good strategy there. Might want to take a different tactic here. Great, right? Let's try it again, right? So you, of course, you can do that in role play in in a face to face setting. But what was so compelling was that these students actually looked like, even though they were CG, they looked like real students. And even though I knew the context was fake, facilitating in this manner was extremely powerful and extremely compelling. Uh, for me, and that was a relatively low-end technology, right? Just 2D um, avatars. You can imagine how powerful that would be if it was immersive. If I felt like I was in an actual classroom setting filled with students, could you feel the spit wads coming? Yeah, I, in could feel the spit wads. I could feel the spit wads. I could feel the spit wads. And if you, I'll, I'll just say, you know, for me, probably the most sort of breathtaking thing I've ever seen, really, in, in, in terms of VR, was um, you could Google this later. It's the um, the Holocaust survivor. It's the hologram. You, maybe some of you have seen this, but but basically, it's it's a a volumetric video of a, of a Holocaust survivor that appears as a hologram in front of you. Uh, this is de designed out of uh, USC. They've got an artificial intelligent back end that you can basically sit down in front of this hologram and ask this person, uh, this hologram, any question about his experience while in a concentration camp, and this person will answer you in real time as if he is listening to you. Of course, he's not, but it's this magical artificial intelligent back end that responds dynamically to your question can query this vast database of over 1,700 questions that it has already answered in another time, stitch together a response and spit back to you just as if you're speaking to it live. It's, a, it's incredible. That's, yeah, that's great. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I would just say quickly, I feel like sometimes I'm in the business of magnifying emotion and, and that's inspiration, wonder, fear, hatred, uh, empathy, and at least in 360 video right now that, um, the experiences that do that when you walk away and you and you have that kind of emotional, um, you know, that's that's what you leave with. It, and then I feel like those are the ones that have done their job. And so uh, there's a lot of really good stuff out there, but um, you know, I would just encourage you guys to try and see it for yourself. So um, as we start to approach uh, the the end of our time with this panel, and then we're gonna get to uh, to Trish. Um, uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you to the panel. Let's give them a big round of applause. Um, uh, because